Uh, are you introducing all of us in the beginning? Should we be with video? Uh, no, I'll introduce you before your talk. All right. We'll just give a minute for everyone to populate. All right, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Long-Term Animal Research Seminar Series. My name is Liz Lang, and this fall I'm co-hosting with Matthew Zippel. We continue this semester's set of seminars with talks from Dr. Aaron Kane, Dr. Amelia Alani, and Dr. Lee Corin. Before I introduce Aaron, I will make a few announcements. If you're participating via Zoom, you should see a Q&A tab at the top or bottom of your screen. If you open that tab, you'll be able to type any questions that you have, as well as see or upvote other people's questions. At the end of the talk, we'll go through those questions, starting with the ones with the most votes. However, if you have a clarifying question that you feel needs to be addressed during the talk in order for you to understand something, you can type clarification in capital letters at the start of your question. And our speakers have said that they will do their best to answer those clarification questions in real time. Lastly, recordings of all of the talks will be available on YouTube shortly after they conclude. So if you need to leave early or know others who are unable to attend live, this talk will be available for viewing and reviewing after it's complete. Now, today I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Aaron Kane, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Anthropology at Boston University. Aaron received her PhD from Ohio State University before starting her current position. Her work integrates observational studies, morphological measures, and physiology to examine the effects of resource distribution on primate social behavior, life history, and community ecology. She's worked on several different primate species, but today she's going to talk on her work on orangutans and promised baby orangutan pictures. So I'm very excited um, to welcome Erin today. And so now I'll let her take over. Great. So welcome, Erin. Thank you guys so much for having me. Let me just get my screen shared and we should be ready to go. All right, are we seeing everything? Cool. Um, all right, well, thank you guys so much for allowing me to come and speak to you today. Um, I'm really excited to talk about long lives in complex environments, how orangutans develop ecological competence. And before I begin, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors and particularly my supervisor, Cheryl Knott. All right, there we go. So let me take you to Gunung Palung National Park, which is in West Kalimantan on the island of Borneo in Indonesia. Um, Gunung Palung National Park is a, a pretty big national park that's focused around two large mountains. It's surrounded by a matrix of what was once primary rainforest, but at this point in time is mostly kind of small scale agriculture, rubber plantations, and of course, palm oil plantations. Where we actually conduct our research is about a five hour hike into the center of the park. Um, our camp is located right kind of at the confluence of two rivers as the um, the forest starts climbing up the mountain essentially. So it's this really amazing mosaic of a bunch of different habitats. So we have alluvial forest, we have upland forest, we have palm swamp, um, and our orangutans range throughout this sort of matrix. One of the things that makes Gunung Palung a particularly interesting place to study primates and, and ecology in general is that it is a forest which is characterized by extremely high variability variation in fruit availability. Um, and that variation is pretty unpredictable. So this was a forest like many other forests in the region that's dominated by dipterocarp trees. These trees um, mast produce, so kind of unpredictably to some degree cued by um, El Nino cycles. These trees produce a lot of fruit in a short period of time. And then for some subsequent period of time, there isn't a lot of fruit. So we get this real spike in fruit availability for a month or maybe two months. And then for maybe a year, maybe three years, there just isn't a whole lot of fruit available. Unsurprisingly, orangutan diets shift pretty dramatically in response to this variability in fruit availability. Um, so when there is fruit available, they will eat you know, 4,000 calories worth of fruit in a day. Um, when there isn't a lot of fruit available, they tend to eat mostly things like leaves, bark, pith, insects, foods that aren't necessarily um, really calorie rich or easy to get calories out of. Um, so kind of as a visual example, this is um, you know, the bark, the pith, the leaves and unripe fruit that make up a lot of their diet when um, there isn't a mast fruiting period. And 
on the other hand, when there is a lot of fruit, they're eating these really um, sugar rich, kind of energy rich, easily digestible food items. Now, compared to most mammals, primates have a really extended life history and a very long development period. This can last multiple years. And if we look across the primates in general, we see that orangutans actually have the longest and most extended life history of any primate. So we ha they have a really long interbirth interval between seven and nine years um, and a long juvenile period and a late age at sexual maturity. So orangutans will probably spend somewhere between nine and 12 years with their mothers um, moving through the forest. For most of this time, they're actually semi-solitary. So they don't live in a social group. It's usually just a mother and her offspring. And occasionally they'll overlap with other individuals. So if we think about what happens during this juvenile period, one interesting kind of theme compared to other primates and orangutans nurse for an even longer period. Sorry, I'm getting a, a mark that my internet is unstable, so let me turn off my camera for a moment. Um, so if we look at sort of on the left here, this is most primates kind of pattern of lactation. Um, and for a while, milk supplies the bulk of their energy needs. Um, and as they start to wean, they transition pretty quickly to eating mostly solid foods in the great ape um, kind of pattern, which is further the one on the right, um, milk only supplies most of their energy needs for, for a relatively short proportion of their juvenile period. And then they start to supplement with solid foods. And so this lactation lasts for a pretty long time. And this actually varies a little bit in orangutans because what we see is that there's a, a degree of supplementation and a lot of variation in how much energy they're getting from milk versus solid foods. And we think that this is something that's going to vary um, usually in response to fruit availability. Um, what's cool is that the supplementation can last for a really long time. So there's this really awesome paper from um, 2017 where they looked at isotopic indicators of nursing and weaning in teeth. And they found indicators of nursing lasting for eight years. So nursing is having a, you know, enough of a, a caloric impact that it's leaving isotopic traces in teeth during development for about eight years, which is a really, really long time. <laughs> Um, so one consequence of this is that orangutans have a really long time when they can sort of rely on their mothers to supplement their diets while they learn how to be successful at eating the kind of complicated foods that orangutans are eating, right? They can take a much longer time to develop ecological competence than a lot of other primates. So this is a, a sooty mangabe. This guy is probably seven or eight months old, and he's already successfully eating these um, seeds that they eat that are about as hard as a cherry pit by before he's even a full year old. On the other hand, baby orangutans are still mostly nursing and they really aren't eating a lot of foods that adults eat competently. Um, so this is great for juveniles because it means that you can always fall back on your mom to supplement your energy needs. Um, but for moms, this probably represents a pretty significant energetic burden, especially during these low fruit periods when we know that adult females are consuming fewer calories and are already sort of balancing the right at the, um, the verge of being in negative energy balance. So what this means is that for mothers, getting offspring to competently eat foods, even challenging ones kind of quickly and reliably is a good thing to do. It's, it's beneficial for them. The question is how? And we know from a lot of research at other field sites that mother offspring pairs share about 90% of their diet um, and that there's no actual direct teaching of mothers and offspring when it comes to how you eat foods. It's not like mothers are, you know, molding their, their infant's hands or something like that. Instead, most of this knowledge transfer seems to be through direct observation and to a lesser extent, food sharing. Um, offspring will actively solicit food transfer of challenging foods, so begging um, for food from their mothers. And mothers will tolerate this to varying degrees, but they're much more tolerant of younger individuals. So um, it seems like food sharing and co-feeding tolerance um, facilitate kind of the development of ecological competence. And so what I'm particularly interested in is if there's a relationship between food complexity and the degree to which individuals are kind of allowing food sharing to happen. 
This is especially salient at the park where we do our research because a lot of other forests where people study orangutans have invasive fruit species that provide sort of year round calories um, in a way that isn't true at GP. Um, and so studying this at a relatively pristine site can help us understand sort of the, the bigger picture of food sharing and ecological um, food sharing and the development of ecological competence. So we had two big predictions. First, we predict that mothers more frequently share um, and co-feed on more challenging foods. And if we look at kind of how adults are sharing and tolerating um, kind of co-feeding, we don't expect to see any sort of relationship between food kind or quality um, and the frequency which, which, with which foods are shared. So our data are derived from full day follows um, over this 10 year period. This is kind of just a subset of those data, um, but during this, this subset, we collected all observations of food transfer and feeding tolerance, which in this case we, decide, we define as having individuals feeding in the same tree. Um, we recorded food type and species, um, and then we also recorded some different measures of food complexity. Um, so we looked at adult feeding rate, assuming that foods that take longer to eat will be more complicated. We recorded wet weight, assuming that heavier foods are going to be more complex. And we recorded the proportion of non-structural carbohydrates, assuming that these are going to be foods which are actually more difficult to digest. So if you look at the data for food tolerance, we saw about 15, 1,600 observations of females co-feeding with other adults and only three males co-feeding with other, um, other males. And we have about 1,500 observations of mother offspring co-feeding. And the co-feeding looks pretty similar, whether it's adults on the left or um, offspring on the right. Um, for the most part, they're co-feeding and tolerating co-feeding um, while foraging on fruit to a lesser extent, leaves. If you look at food transfer, it gets a little bit more interesting, I think. Um, we only had 21 observations of food sharing between adults, and these were all females sharing with other adults. We have about 245 observations of mothers sharing with offspring. The vast majority of these are sharing with infants, so individuals under the age of two. Only about 10% of those um, food sharing events occurred with juveniles who are baby or offspring over the age of three. So this is sort of the proportion of foods that females are sharing with other adults. Um, and you can see there's really, you know, first of all, it's a very small sample size, so it's hard to draw any sort of useful conclusion. Um, but if we look at infants it's, or offspring, it's pretty clear that they're, they're primarily sharing um, fruit and then to some degree ants and termites. So when we look at sort of the relationship between food sharing and tolerance and the complexity of the resources, we see that foods transferred between mothers and infants are eaten significantly more slowly than foods that are where co-feeding is tolerated or where food is transferred or tolerated between adults. So slower foods are transferred more frequently. Um, and this is just another sort of visualization looking at the relationship between the frequency of food sharing in this axis up here versus the feeding rate. So again, you can see that you know, more frequently shared foods are eaten more slowly. Um, fruits transferred between mothers and infants are significantly heavier. Um, and they have a higher proportion of total non-structural carbohydrates. Um, so there's, this is a smaller subsample of foods that we have this carbohydrate data for, but basically the more um, total non-structural carbohydrates, the more frequently fruits are shared between mothers and infants. So what does this all mean? Well, adult-adult pairs transfer different kinds and qualities of foods than mother-offspring pairs, which is what we predicted. Um, and we see a significant correlation between the rate of food sharing and the consumption of large, slowly eaten fruits that are high in non-structural carbohydrates. Um, so this all suggests that mothers are transferring more complex foods to their offspring. Um, and this further suggests that food transfer is going to be facilitating knowledge transfer in the development of ecological competence, specifically around those more complex, um, challenging to consume foods. So let me end here um, by thanking you all, um, Thri Makasi in, in Indonesian, um, for letting me speak to you. And I think we have some time for questions. So thanks for that.
Thanks, Erin. That was yeah. really great. Let me um, see if I can get back to my video now that I am. Yeah. Uh, I have a question to start. So I'm curious if you uh, saw or looked into variation in different individuals or different mothers and their propensity to share and how that maybe affected offspring survival or any offspring traits or if that's something you plan on looking at. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm, I would be very unsurprised if there is differences, especially um, thinking about older versus primiparous, primiparous mothers, right, new versus old mothers. Um, so I guess the challenge of studying these questions with orangutans is that they live for a really long time, right? So, um, and infant mortality is actually extremely low. Um, it's, it's comparable to Swiss humans. <laughs> so, what that means is it's hard to see sort of a, a, a direct impact on um, fitness because you have these really long generations and then you also have really high survivability. Um, what we do see almost certainly is differences in energy balance and in health biomarkers. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's an exciting question. Great, thank you. Um, okay, and Brett, asks, uh, does the proportion of shared foods mirror the overall proportions of different food types eaten? That is a great question. So they are over sharing um, fruit um, relative to what they're eating. Um, I So kind of a next step is that we need to control for fruit availability when we're looking at this, because um, that's not something that I've controlled for at this point in time. Um, but yeah, it looks like they're over sharing fruit um, relative to the proportion of fruit in their diet. Great. Well, thank you. I think we'll turn it over now. And if any other questions come in, uh, stay tuned and we may ask some more at the end. Great Sounds talk. Good. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. All right. So our second talk is a special joint talk given by Amiyal Alani and Lee Corin. Amiyal is a senior lecturer at Bar Ilan University, and his lab studies social behavior in wild birds and mammals using social networking communication patterns. While Lee Corrin is associate professor at Bar Ilan University, and her lab seeks to understand the proximate causes of social behavior by examining the physiology of wild animals. And what's really exciting about the seminar today is that we're going to hear from both of them about their long term collaborative project where they combine their expertise to understand the proximate causes and ultimate consequences of social behavior in rock hyraxes. So welcome, and you can take it away now. Great, thank you for the introduction and uh, for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful series. Um, so Lee, how did it all start? Well, funny question, 22 years later, we've been um, studying these hyraxes. That's Wait, I'm not, not even the... in the first slide, sorry. Twenty-two years later, <laughs> um, for my master's, I was planning on studying guarding behavior in rock hyrax. Uh, it was supposed to be a very specific, very focused question, um, which ended up being not really interesting because all of them guard and there's nothing interesting about it. Um, but being there in the field and observing these interesting animals' behavior brought us just to more and more questions that kept on expanding over time and um, bringing us just more and more things to look at. So these are the three of us um, that are directing the, the project right now. Eli Geffen right here was my master's and PhD supervisor. And this is Amiel over here, he, who was um, Eli, Eli's um, PhD student as well. And me that I started it for my master's and I'm still involved. And these are all the other graduate students that have been um, involved with it since, um, all their great minds and eyes and questions after thousands of hours in the field, spending a lot of time observing these animals have brought all these questions that we're gonna share some of them with you. Um, and the, the project keeps on evolving and, and bringing really, really neat stuff that we are exciting, excited to um, share and excited to, to research all the time. So this is what it looks like. This is the window fall. Um, it's like the, the, the window to our site. Um, for us, at least, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. Um, this is looking eastwards. You could see the Dead Sea and the country of Jordan on the other side. And this is one of our field sites. We actually have two field sites. This is Engedi. Um, you could see part of Israel. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. 
Um, this is Tel Aviv in Jerusalem, and we are located here on the shore of the Dead Sea. And in the En Gedi Nature Reserve, we've got two sites. One of them is El Ugot. Um, to get to it, it's uh, about an hour hike into the reserve. And that's where I started my master's in 1998. Um, and then in 2002, for my PhD, we started on, in another site as well in, in David Canyon, which is what we overlooked um, from, the, from the other pictures from the window. Um, over these two sites, we have um, about 500 marks hyrax over the 22 years um, that we have been studying continuously. And these are just some sites that you could see how beautiful it is. Um, you could see basically that it's a pretty rugged area. Um, it's in the Ju Judean desert and there's very sheer um, rock cliffs, um, very, very dramatic um, 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 cliffs that uh, overlook um, the canyons. Um, and luckily because it's a, it's a desert oasis, there's water year round. You could see some of the waterfalls and some of the water flowing. And around those water, there's greenery and food for the hyrax and for other wildlife and plenty of rocks and crevices where the hyraxes make their home. Um, but maybe before we start talking about our project, um, Amial, can you tell us just a little bit about hyraxes and where they evolved from? Thanks. So hyraxes belong to the Afrotheria group. It's an ancient group of mammals that evolved in uh, Africa and includes weird creatures such as elephants, tenrex, and arvar, aardvarks. And within this group, there are currently five defined hyrax species. Two of, the, of them are pretty social, the rock hyrax that we study and the bush hyrax, which is smaller, but uh, sometimes they live in mixed uh, species groups. And there are three species of uh, tree hyrax uh, that um, are mostly solitary. If we were studying hyrax 30 to 40 million years ago, we would study different species such as the titano hyrax, the megalo hyrax, and the antilo hyrax. And you can see they are much bigger than the procavia that we have today. Uh, so these species uh, got extinct probably due to competition with um, as, as primates and uh, antelopes. Rock hyraxes can be found in many places in Africa from um, uh, Southern Africa, uh, Eastern and Western Africa and some parts of the Middle East. And we study them here in Israel uh, towards the Northern uh, end of their range. So uh, just a few words about our methods. Each year we uh, try to trap um, all the population. We manage to trap usually about 90%. And then we mark them if they are not adult yet, they get a unique set of earrings that we can identify from a distance. And if they are adults, they get a tagged collar that we can have a sort of a name for them. And Hyrax says um, the main predator for adults now is uh, wolves. In uh, the past, actually, when Lee started the research, there were still leopards in the reserve, but unfortunately, they are now extinct in Israel. Um, uh, predators that are a danger for um, young individuals uh, still include foxes and raptors. I want to uh, talk a few minutes about social structure. So this is a social network of uh, one of the, our population um, summarizing interactions over uh, one field season, which lasts a few months. Uh, you can see here, that hyraxes live in groups. Females are in white and males are in black. And these groups include uh, mostly females and their pups and juveniles, and then a resident male, um, like the one here on the left. And females usually stay in their natal group for life, whereas males uh, disperse when reaching adulthood. They become bachelors, like the ones here at the bottom, and these bachelors spend most of their time alone. Lee had one group of bachelors in the past, but most of the time they are pretty solitary. And, and many of them will stay bachelors, but uh, some of them will manage to become resident in another group, not the group they were born in. Um, so to understand the effect of group living on survival, we used mark recapture. Um, this analysis was done by Adi Barokas. Uh, to look at the effect of living in a group versus being uh, mostly solitary. 
And we found that the probability of uh, adult hyraxes to survive to the next year is about 75%. And it's a bit higher in social groups, such as uh, the ones at the bottom here, compared to um, males that are bachelors in each of the Kenyans. So you better live in a group. But on the right side, you can see that your group um, should not be too big because group size is negatively correlated with uh, longevity. So maybe an optimal setting for a hyrax is to be social, to live in a group, but, um, but not a big one. And indeed, the few cases where we observed females um, leaving their natal group and moving to another group, in all of these cases, the females left a larger group and moved to a smaller one. But what about the inner social structure? So you live in a group. What about the, the specific relationships you have there? Uh, so we were observing hierarchies for a long time. And then we realized we can use social network analysis to quantify and analyze these uh, relationships, because not all relationships are um, born equal. And we quantify them by. Um, basically looking at what we call coordinated activity. Hyraxes do not touch each other too much, especially during the hot um, month, but they do things uh, together, such as emerging from the same sleeping den, um, foraging on the same bush or lying on the same rock. And here it's a bit confusing because in these networks, the males are in white and the females are in black. Uh, but you can see four different uh, groups that here we omit the pups, including only adults and juveniles. And we were interested in the question whether if you are more central, and centrality here is depicted by the size of the circle, so um, uh, the larger the circle, the uh, more central the hierarchs, um, uh, did these hierarchs survive better? Uh, because there were, at, at the time, about 10 years ago, starting to get some uh, studies showing this um, um, effect, this association. And we did not find it on an individual level, but we did find an effect of the group uh, structure in which groups that were more egalitarian, like the two groups here at the top, um, uh, provided or, or offered better survival to their members compared to the groups at the bottom where you see some very central individuals uh, in contrast to very weakly connected individuals. So our main result here was that hierarchies that lived in groups with um, higher uh, standard deviation of centrality had lower longevity. Basically, it seemed to be uh, better to live in a group where the social relationships uh, are spread more evenly. We're not still uh, yet sure about this me the mechanism behind this result could be related to uh, stress, but we are um, trying to elucidate that now. And this result joined uh, a list of uh, recent studies summarized very nicely by Snad Mackler at all in a, in a recent uh, science uh, review where um, uh, they summarize relationships between sociality and survival. And in most cases here, mostly in primates and ungulates, this relationship is positive and only one case where uh, in yellow-bellied marmot, this relationship is uh, negative. So if networks are important, and we now know from multiple studies that they are important to longevity, as well as reproductive success, sexual selection, and also pathogen transmission, then how networks form and why do we see some specific structures and not others? And to answer this question, we use data from our long-term study and constructed networks for each, basically, field season, that, which summarizes a few months of, of observations in the field. And we, uh, we, you can try to answer this question in many ways. In this case, we were looking at the building blocks of the networks in what is called in the network jargon, network motifs. And we were interested in a theory coming from social science called structural balance. According to this theory, if you um, describe each uh, relationship as being positive or negative, so for example, if A and B here are in positive relationship, then um, you can get four types of triads um, for these definitions. And uh, according to structural balance theory, 
some of these triads are more stable uh, than others. And in particular, the uh, B configuration, the plus plus minus triad is considered unbalanced and predicted to be unstable. And we all know this case, if I am B, that I am, have a friend or, uh, named A and they have a friend named C and I don't really like C. This always creates some social uh, tension. So we ask, could this apply to animal societies? Could, we, could this be relevant to animal societies? Should, do animals care about these types of configurations? And we found that in, in these networks that we analyzed, um, basically you find much uh, more um, balanced triads that are, should be uh, stable than uh, predicted by chance. And if we're looking at uh, um, what happens to each triad in the following year, this is summarizing basically 11 networks. And you can see that uh, if you're looking at the diagonal, uh, most triad types, the ones that are balanced, stay in the same configuration in the following year, while the plus plus minus triad, uh, most of these triads basically fall apart or change their configuration to more stable uh, triad types. So this suggests that hierarchies basically care about specific for, uh, configuration and they actively change them um, uh, to form more, more stable uh, building blocks, and this has implications for the kind of networks that you can get from, from these types of uh, building blocks. Now we want to um, quantify networks in more detail, and for that we are using in recent years proximity sensors that are attached uh, here at the bottom to the Hyrax collar. We can do that only on adults for now, and these uh, loggers record any interaction with another logger if it's less than a half a meter away. Uh, so here is uh, some data we get from these loggers. You can see here the interactions at a one second resolution of a pair of hyraxes, a female and a male that live in the same group during the months of this December 2017. A black uh, stretch here means they were in, in interaction. The time is on the x-axis. So you can see that in the few first days of the month, they did not uh, sleep together, but they interacted a bit during the middle of the day. Then later they did spend most nights together and interacted less during the um, warmer and daytime when they uh, were foraging, to, um, but not uh, most of the time not together. So we can see some patterns, but also a lot of uh, variation and dynamics. And for us, this opens many new questions about how animals maintain the, these social um, uh, relationships facing so many changes in the environment, the physical and the social environment. And when looking and summarizing these uh, relationships over days, here we can see the daily amount spent together. We can see basically many days, many uh, pairs with stable relationships of varying strength. So this pair at the left has uh, a weak relationship, but still stable. And this one on the right um, has a stronger relationship. It is very unpredictable on a daily basis, but they, they do maintain in, in more than 80% of the pairs a stable relationship. And the question uh, for us is now, how do they manage to do it? I want to summarize this part with showing uh, um, an animation of the network over uh, a bit less than um, two months produced by our student Camille board. Uh, so this is data from the proximity sensors showing groups of hyraxes. Each uh, color is a different group. And the bachelor males here in gray, uh, towards the start of the mating season, they approach the groups to get a chance to mate, to copulate with the females. And you will see that towards the end of this animation, these bachelors will detach again uh, from the group and uh, go back to being mostly alone. So we can see that uh, the groups basically maintain the structure over time with the bachelors in producing a lot of um, uh, changes in the network and, and, um, and basically changing its uh, configuration over time. So this opens many questions again about how social structure evolves and how um, stability that is found in many species is uh, maintained over time. So we, we can say a few words about the year of the hyrax. Um, um, females um, gave birth in March 
uh, it is synchronized and we'll see why. And then there are a few months where we define it as a time to gain reputation and Lee will tell you a, a lot more about that uh, during the early sp the spring and early summer. Then we have a short mating season in July that lasts only two to three weeks and then a long period to period with I'd say less activity during uh, the fall and uh, winter. So you can see that uh, gestation period is very long from mating in July till birth in uh, March. It is about seven and a half months long. So how do you gain reputation towards the mating season? While I was in the field um, during my master's, um, we are in the field yearly from March until after the mating season. Unfortunately, we never really know when the mating season will start. So we're very, um, very observant, very vigilant during July and August. But while I was waiting for the for the mating season, I was I was hearing hyraxes, and it was very confusing because nowhere did I know that they sang such um, such amazing songs. Um, actually, a lot of birders that um, hike in the reserve and come bird watching, we heard them uh, discussing which bird it is and who it is um, calling. And I just want to let you hear um, one Hyrex's song, just so you get an, an idea of what we're going to be talking about for the next little while. So this is what it sounds like. So a basic hyrax call or song, how, the way we term them, are made up of whales. This is a sonogram of a, one bout of a song of chucks, which are very, very short pieces of very short elements, and snorts, which are very broad band, noisy, um, harsh elements, where you could see the formant frequencies. And they always made me laugh and then very, very curious. So I'll be talking more about snorts later on. At first, we just wanted to see who sings. It seemed to me at first um, that there were two types of males. There are males that sing, and I call them singers, and that there are males that were silent. Many years later, Amial came along and put on tiny tape recorders, which he'll tell you about in a bit. And then we found out that they all actually sing. But at first, um, I only heard the, the singers, the ones that sing a lot. Um, and those, those were males that were older. Um, we, we proxied their age by their weight. Um, and these uh, males were also higher ranking. So look, using David's score, we saw that they, they were um, number one, which means like they were more um, alpha, more um, socially um, up at the top of the, of the class, and that they had higher cortisol levels, uh, which could be because they're there um, um, calling and um, having predators um, um, giving them attention, or it's possible because of their social status. So we tried to zoom in on the, on, the, on the cortisol levels for the males and looked only on the singers, the one that produced a lot of songs. And we found here on the x-axis is a social status, social rank. Number one from now on in all these graphs is the most dominant animal. And on the y-axis is the, the cortisol levels. And we found that the males that were most dominant in the groups are the ones that had the highest cortisol levels if we compare it with all the other males that were around, which is pretty, pretty, pretty um, interesting result. And a, a lot of communal animals, um, it's known in, so, in social animals that the alpha males often have higher glucocorticoids levels. And just because we're gonna be mentioning steroids a few more times, I just wanna say a word about the methodology. Um, usually standard approaches for obtaining steroid samples are from blood samples, which are really difficult to obtain in the field, um, to store it and process, and also steroid levels rapidly change, um, reacting to capture and handling. So we have been using HAIR, which is an integrating the steroid levels over the time of growth. And one of the major advantages is that it's insensitive to the, to the momentary stress of capture and handling. The roots of entry into the hair are presumably the capillary blood that feeds the hair as it grows, as well as sebaceous glands and sweat glands that are around the hair, and also some passive exposure. And in social animals, of course, there could be urination or, um, or saliva transfer onto the hair, 
um, and that's another route of entry. Um, hair has been um, related to blood and to feces and to saliva, and um, it seems to be pretty stable. And that's whenever we're going to be talking about steroids, it's going to be hair steroids from now on. So back to singing. We used um, vocalizations that, I mean, when I was in the field and I heard Hyraxis sing, I knew right away which individual it is. But using discriminative function analysis of the temporal and spectral acoustic measurements, and also the analysis of the song element order, we showed that the songs were individually identifiable. If we look here at one individual, for example, C, you could see that every single song is different. There are no two songs that are alike. Um, and each one of these uh, little uh, numbers, two, three, and four, denote different years that these songs were recorded, 2002, 2003, or 2004. And we could see that the songs are pretty much, the vo voices at least, are stable over years. And we also found that the voices were not linked neither to relatedness or to geographic location. Later on, we also confirmed that Hyrax are able to discriminate individuals just using their vocal signatures using a controlled playback experiment of the dear enemy effect. Um, song elements um, seem to honestly reflect uh, morphology, social status, condition, and steroid levels. We use principal component analysis on variables extracted from the Hyrax songs, and then a series of multiple regressions, and we found that the songs closely reflected numeral, numerous individual traits. For example, here you could see the body size for, this, for, um, for the males, and they're related to the checks factor. So males that were larger seem to check more. And the formant frequency, for example, are related to the social status. So males that were most dominant, again, in the first position, seem to have lower formant frequencies. And these were measured from the snorts that were also related to social status and to, uh, and to the age um, as well. So we wondered whether Hyrax songs, because they seem to be accurately reflecting individual characteristics, were costly. And then we looked for a new PhD student, and that's when I found Amiel. Oh, that was me. Um, so we, since songs are very loud, you can hear them from a few hundred meters, we wondered if uh, songs could actually serve as handicaps that only males with higher quality with uh, more energy reserves can produce or can produce longer um, singing bouts. Uh, so we had to estimate uh, the amount of singing and also to estimate energy expenditure. For that, we used doubly labeled water to estimate energy expenditure over a number of weeks. And in parallel, we used these tiny recorders here on the top left that we attached to the Hyrax collar. That allowed us to record at, at the same distance, basically very close to the source, and to estimate the, the loudness, the amplitude of uh, multiple call types. And from that, we got actually more than, than we asked for. We got the soundscape of, of the animal, what it does in every minute. And here you can see basically four and a half days of one of the males. Each column is a day and the, the time goes on the y-axis. So you can see that this male wakes up usually at 5.30 a.m. and it is uh, foraging, some uh, movement and eating, then some social sounds, uh, vocalization, including singing, and it takes a nap usually in the hot hours of uh, the afternoon before it resumes activity uh, uh, in the late afternoon and evening and goes to sleep around uh, 9 or 10 uh, p.m. So we could measure uh, the amplitude, uh, or, and that also corresponds to data that we got later from uh, the proximity sensors, where we can see when uh, do uh, most um, interactions occur. And you can see that uh, the longest interactions are during the, the hours of the night when hyraxes basically sleep together, and they interact less during foraging time, especially in summer, which is a, a few hours in early morning and, um, and even in the evening. Uh, so we could now measure uh, the amplitude of different call types and see that indeed singing is much louder than other call types. But we also realized from this data that males sing on average only eight minutes per day uh, with the um, highest uh, average for a male being 22 minutes. So that actually showed that singing is maybe more like, it's not a, a measure of endurance, it's maybe more like a 100 meter run. It re may require a lot of energy, but on the overall budget of a week or a day, 
it's, it's not much. And we did not find a correlation between uh, the amount of singing, the duration of singing, and um, the energy expenditure. So singing can still serve as a handicap, perhaps by exposing the male to predators, but not in terms of the energy expended. Later, Vlad Demartsev came as a PhD student, and he measured, uh, used the same recorders to uh, record females, and we found that females use more call types than males, perhaps because they're more social on average. And we can also test uh, uh, the law of brevity. So in human languages, we know that uh, short words such as yes and no are much more common, much more frequently used than long uh, words such as university. And we were wondering if that applies to animal uh, communication. And there are some mixed results in the literature. In Hyrexes that we found that it's not about call duration, it's about call amplitude. That is what matters. And uh, the most frequent um, call types are the ones that are uh, the least loud. So we had all this information about singing, but we still didn't know why or when um, males sing, what the purpose of singing is. We still don't fully understand that. But since there's a drop in singing frequency following the mating season, we think that it might be involved um, with sexual competition. Our observations show that there are several specific contexts that have relatively high probabilities to draw a singing response. Males sing as a reply to other males singing, possibly to compare performances or to jam the competitor's signals. Males often sing as a response to distress and alarm call, as well as during predator presence, possibly to grab the attention of the attentive audience. But most song types are what we term spontaneous because we don't have any observable trigger. We don't know why they are. So we hypothesized that if males sing to self-advertise, they should enhance their singing whenever an audience is present. So Vlad looked at and compared induced songs and some spontaneous songs. Induced songs are in black and spontaneous songs are in white. Um, both are the same length and the number of bouts per song, but the interval between bouts was significantly decreased in induced songs so that they were much faster. And the bouts were also longer when songs were induced. So it's possibly indicating that higher aerob aerobic capacity and maybe more attractiveness if singing is a is function of uh, sexual selection. He also used Shannon index um, to look at the entropy or the number of switches, um, the transitions between the vocal elements and found that in induced songs, there were more transitions and that induced songs contain more checks and more snorts. So just to remind you what the elements are, whales are, look like this, and they're usually in the beginning of the song and it sounds like this. Checks are very, very short. They sound like this. And snorts are those funny, low, harsh songs. Um, they usually come at the end of the song, but they could be in the middle and they could come as a group of snorts. And if they're really, really good snorts, they sound like this. So these snorts are really, really interesting because they're the rarest element in the song and not all hyrexes produce it. And its relative occurrence increases with age and with dominance. So here, this is a part of my PhD work. We found that um, snorts increase with social status. So this is David's score on the x-axis and the males that had higher David's score, which means that they were more dominant, used the snort components much more. In many species, the lo low frequency and noisy or harsh sounds accompany ag agonistic interactions and function as a badge of aggression or of dominance. So we wanted to look whether um, snorts actually change the way that other males respond to songs. And Vlad did a series of playback experiments of using both natural and art artificially manipulated songs. And he found that the probability of initiating counter singing by other nearby males increases with the number of snorts in the stimulus songs, which is very, very weird and interesting because if snorts were aggressive, we would think that conspecifics would not 
answer to them, but would rather um, refrain from answering if snorts were used. So Vlad used both um, snorts that were naturally rich, um, and then some songs where he erased all the other elements and, and left only snorts in the songs, and then added artificial snorts um, to songs that already had um, at all the elements in them. And all of songs with more snorts, you could see here, had higher reply frequency, reply rates. So it did seem strange and we decided that we had to look into it more in depth. And then Yishai Weissman came in to do his PhD and zoomed in on the snort characteristics and tried to quantify the harshness in the snorts. In the human voice literature, there are two measurements to quantify harshness. There's shimmer, which me measures the amplitude um, deviation. And then there's jitter, with, which measures um, the, the different time, the period deviation. And we use both of these measurements to quantify the variation of, of, between the snorts um, pulses. So what he found is that, first of all, induced songs, that's the solid line, seem to be always very harsh um, and long. Induced, I mean, reminding you are situations where there's other, other um, hyrexes present that seem to be in a social context. While in, in um, spontaneous songs, the high ranked singers produced harsher snorts. These are the ones that are high, um, ranked higher, and, but the heavier males seem to produce smoother snorts. So it's opposite um, reactions. On one hand, those that are more um, aggressive seem to use the snort roughness to shore their aggressiveness. On the other hand, it seems that snorts producing such a harsh song but maybe in a smoother manner might be a handicap and only older and more um, experienced males are able to produce it. Um, so we've been thinking of how it could be explained. Probably it could be um, explained by Zahavi's handicap theory because for a, a signal to be, um, to be honest, it needs to have some sort of um, handicap and in order to maintain handicap at all time, you have to be able to use it when confront even when there's no con specific around. So it's possible that the spontaneous songs are the ones that show that capability um, because they're used all the time, even if there's not other um, males around. Um, in a series of, um, of playback experiments, he also saw that uh, males replied to songs that were shorter and also smoother. So it does seem that long, long and harsh snorts deter con specifics from answering. The next step for us was to look at, um, at testosterone. Um, we wanted to ask whether testosterone might be involved because snort seems to be a social, a signal that displays social status, which is related to testosterone males of many species. Um, we found that testosterone was related to snort roughness in spontaneous songs, so that males that had higher testosterone also had rougher snorts. That was in spontaneous songs. But in induced songs, we found that it was actually the opposite. The males that had um, higher testosterone actually snorted smoother snorts. And what Yishai thought was that maybe those males that were just very aggressive and per perhaps also very dominant in an induced situation when there was a social situation were calmer and they were actually were, were able to produce smoother snorts while um, maybe younger um, individuals or those with lower testosterone uh, maybe were just unsure of social in interactions and induced songs. And that snort harshness that they show could be a show of fear rather than aggression. Um, other studies have shown that harshness might be related to not just aggression, but also fear. And it, look, it shows um, that context possibly. Beyond aggression, and testosterone is also associated with many morphological uh, features, physiological processes, and social behaviors in both sexes. Um, but the relationship between testosterone and male population success and mate choice are well established in multiple systems. There's also evidence of trade-offs between parental behavior and reproductive success um, um, that could be mediated via testosterone. However, even if testosterone is present in similar concentrations in circulation, it, also, it often affects males and females in a very different manner. 
So in hyrexes, um, they're one of the species that have the same um, similar amounts of testosterone. Uh, we checked that um, in, not only in our system, in our study system, we've checked that in hyrexes in other populations because we found that very, very interesting. We've checked that in the circulation and also in the hair, and it seems to be a constant year round. Um, high female testosterone may be a byproduct of high male testosterone, having co-evolved as a consequence of selection on males for increased levels. Um, we don't know because um, male, male and female testosterone is very high. It's some of the highest that are recorded in nature. But despite that high testosterone, females reproduce annually. Uh, the gestation period is very long. It's almost eight months. And they nurse up to six pups for up to a year. So maternal investment is very, very high. We wanted to see whether testosterone um, in, is involved with social status. We know that in males, we expected the ones that were most dominant, again, in the first position to have the highest testosterone levels. The males here are the crosses and the dashed line is the male trend. And we saw what we expected in the males. But in the females, we, we found the exact opposite that the females here are their circles, and this is the female trend, that the females that were most dominant in the first position were the ones that had the lowest testosterone levels, um, implying that there might be a cost involved with testosterone for these females. Um, so the next question was to see whether testosterone in females had another cost involved, and we wanted to look at mating relate, related um, um, costs, and we wanted to look at mating in general. Now we said already the mating period is very short in the hyrax. It could be just a few days per female and overall only a few weeks. Um, so in order to look at sexual selection, we had to pull together observations of mating relating interactions for over a decade um, on a population level. It wasn't very many um, because often they, they mate behind rocks or we start seeing something happening and then they, we don't see them anymore. That's one of the advantages of a long-term research that we could pull all these individual observations together. And what we found here, here are the males that are resident that live with a group of females and the males that are bachelors is that bachelors and, and, and residents are not different from each other, which was rather surprising. We thought that resident males would at least have advantage over mating. Uh, we found that females were, cho were choosier. They rejected males mo much more than males rejected females, but that did happen. Some males did reject females. Um, and then the next thing was to think of how we could maybe look at it at a different level. Uh, most studies look um, on um, population on a population level, but often individuals don't meet other individuals from all over the population, especially in a study area like ours where there's two different canyons. It was unlikely that it was relevant for a female to be mating with a male from another population. And then we brought in, Amiel brought in tools from social network theory to create sexual networks. Here the females are in red and the males are in blue. The triangles are the resident males and the bachelors are um, the squares. And the arrows show some sort of an interest, uh, mating, um, following each other, um, other things that are related to breeding. Um, later on using the, the uh, proximity loggers, we found that actually a premise is that hyrax stay very local and don't move around is actually false. Um, just as an aside, we had one male, this is AE, one male that I guess didn't, uh, wasn't very happy in his sexual niche. Uh, this is Arugot, where he spent most of his life. That's in red here. That's Arugot um, in the red triangles. And at some point around the mating period, he dashed over to David. You could see here the, um, the, the scale. The, 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 um, it's very, very far away. We don't know how he did it, whether he crossed the desert, which is very arid and dangerous, or whether he walked through the whole canyons back and forth. But this male spent a day or two in David, then went back to Arugot, then I guess wanted to check out if things change in David, went back and then went back to Arugot and then back to David. So um, only through having this amazing new technologies we're able to learn um, more things we don't know. Um, but back to sexual networks, uh, looking at a smaller scale, we wanted to see what, what um, determined the copulation success, whether individuals um, made it or not made it according to our observations. So some of you could see that rock hyrax are polygenandrous, which means that some males and some females mate with multiple partners. 
Um, and those partners have also multiple partners. Um, and we could look at the attributes of, of the individuals and their partners and try to determine what um, actually um, helps their reproductive success and their mating success. So this male, for example, has three female partners. And as far as we saw, they didn't have any, part, any other sexual partners themselves. But if we look at this female, she had two sexual partners, two males, and these males um, had six female partners between um, all of them. So we could look at that female's attributes, but also on all the individual attributes of all her competitors and try to determine what helps her reproduction success, her copulation success. And we found that it's determined not only by the individual quality, uh, for example, for males, even if they're very dominant, if they had other dominant males as their competitors, their copulation success was low. Um, but it's also determined by the social and sexual niches that the individual occupies. And for females, it meant that if a female was central in her social network, she had a good chance of copulating and also if she was a mother in a previous year. And if she had competitors in the area that were in themselves very central in the social networks, that um, copulation success even increased. Next, we wanted to see whether testosterone might have something to do with, um, with copulation success. Um, and we um, entered, um, added the testosterone data with our mating related data. All of these pictures are, by the way, taken from our, through our telescope, and this is how we observe them from far away. And this is the rough data for the next, um, this is um, for the next few graphs. On the x-axis, we're gonna see the female testosterone levels. And on the y-axis, we're gonna see the male testosterone levels. And this is the raw data with the, with the rejections in the, in the empty circles and copulation success in the full circles. And then we looked at the probability of copulation success and the hotter the numbers, um, the colors, um, the higher copulation success. So our full factorial model showed that there was an interaction between the sexes so that males with high testosterone had the highest copulation success, while females with the lowest um, testosterone also had the highest copulation success. And the females with the highest testosterone had the lowest copulation success. So it seems once again that there might be um, some cost of testosterone on females we also found that testosterone had nothing to do with chew dizziness. We're thinking that similarly to the dark eyed juncos, that both males and females that would have high testosterone would be less choosy, but it seemed that choosiness had nothing to do with testosterone at all. And that testosterone had nothing to do with initiation of sexual activity. Both males and females were found in both roles as initiators, initiators and as receivers, and it had nothing to do with uh, testosterone. And testosterone had nothing to do also with rejection rates in both um, sexes. Um, <clears throat> since females made it with multiple males, the next things we wanted to ask is whether um, there was some sort of um, um, mate guarding involved. Um, often mate guarding involves to um, manipulate female reproduction. And we found that there was some mate um, guarding, but it, all the mate guarding almost was done by the resident males. The, the mate guarding instances are in the white um, columns and here on top are the resident males and on the bottom are the bachelor males. And you could see that only very few instances, uh, observations were on bachelor males that were um, um, mate guarding, but um, resident males tended to mate guard um, females that were mothers in previous years um, perhaps there were the higher quality mothers um, of females. And we saw previously that those are the ones that were more likely to copulate. Um, as an aside, we have an, a new project in my lab. This is um, 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 observations um, from data, new data from captive um, Hyrax colony in Barilan University. And that looking at um, possible different um, sperm quality from different males, you could see here, the pink heads are the dead sperm and the yellow heads are the live sperm. And recently we've started um, obtaining sperm from hyraxes in the field. Um, so we could see that perhaps whether there is sperm competition as they do mate with multiple males. Um, going back to mate guarding, um, we wanted to see whether testosterone was involved in mate guarding as well. Um, this data is based on a very few points. Um, our data includes um, 20 successful copulations of which mate guarding was observed in eight. 
And again, here is testosterone in females and males were, um, testosterone in males was in the y-axis. And our model showed that there is, again, an interaction where uh, males with high testosterone tended to mate guard females with low testosterone. Um, our model also revealed that sometimes males with low testosterone tended to mate guard um, females with high testosterone. So putting it all together, um, we found a disassociative mating and mate guarding with respect to testosterone. So that high um, testosterone males mate with low testosterone females and assortative mating <clears throat> and mate guarding with respect to social status because um, both high ranking males and females seem to copulate, which open up a lot of intriguing questions relating to the role of testosterone in mediating a similar trade-off in males and in female reproductive success. And since selection differs between the sexes, a trait that is beneficial to one sex um, can be detrimental to the other sex. And similarly, if male and female testosterone are correlated, elevation of male testosterone may be constrained by the females. Um, additional fitness related parameters such as maternal behavior should be tested next as it may be hardwired in the way that precludes the effect of testosterone as seen in the dark eyed junko by the Ketterson lab, for example. And analysis of reproductive success, which is well underway, will help us provide clues on the fitness cost of testosterone in both sexes. This parentage analysis was supposed to be part of my master's and then supposed to be part of my PhD. And then 22 years later, we finally um, um, finished um, analyzing 400 um, um, hyrexes. You could see that um, the arrows indicate a mother offspring pair and the different colors denote different groups. So it seemed to be well segregated. And you could um, imagine there's an imaginary line between the two um, canyons that we work. So it looks like there's very little movement um, as far as the genetic materials. Um, but um, figuring out the reproductive success will answer a lot of the questions we have, as well as provide perhaps clues about the benefits of singing or snorting and other peculiar hyrex features. So putting it all together, I think um, we've given you a little bit of a taste of a year of the Hyrax. Um, we're interested um, in um, questions um, that have to do with birth and reproductive success about singing and how Hyrax gained their reputation and are able to put um, themselves forward and um, be able to mate. In the mating period, what really happens there, um, until now we've only used observations and it is very limited in the data that we have, but it's intriguing and the interaction between social status and social networks and sexual networks is still underway and the analysis is, is very, very interesting. And of course, how they manage to survive their harsh environment through all the, um, the, all the challenges that they have are underway. So we wanna thank you. And we also wanna thank the Engedi Nature Reserve and the Rangers and the Engedi Field School for hosting us all these years. Um, the many research assistants, um, the funding bodies that have been consistent in their funding and our institutions that have been amazing as well. And we'd love to take questions. Great, thank you both. That was a wonderful talk. Um, we have a few questions here. So first, Joanna Bryson asks or says that in macaques, egalitarianism is associated with a lack of predation and or a lack of monopolizable resources. And so either of these things could impact the life expectancy of particularly low status individuals. So I'm wondering, and she's wondering if you could speculate as to what you think might be driving the egalitarianism in the rock hyraxes and could the loss of lower status individuals account for the lower average life expectancy that we, you see? Um, well, I, I think that in our case, the lack of resources is not really an issue. Uh, and Gedi is pretty lush for a hyrax. We see other populations in Israel that live in uh, southern parts of the Negev desert where there is uh, much less vegetation. So I don't think that, um, that, uh, vegeta that resources um, are the issue. We do suspect that it's related to stress that is higher in the non-egalitarian uh, groups compared to egalitarian ones. I didn't really get the last part of the question. Did you get it? No. Can you repeat? 
Yeah, of course. Um, just that, do you think that, so you think stress then is related to the egalitarianism of the groups. And so would that potentially affect lower status individuals more than higher status individuals? And could that explain their survival difference? So like are just the lower status individuals, the ones that are um, more likely to experience mortality? I'm actually not sure we looked at the effect of social rank on, on survival. So this is a good question and, and something we should look into. And um, with respect to stress, we think that if you have like non-egalitarian groups, then stress might affect all individuals. And that's why you don't see the effect that is found in other uh, species that, that more central individuals survive uh, better, um, which might indicate that, for example, it's about predation where you are weakly connected, you have less other individuals to alert you about uh, predators. But the, it surely opens uh, many questions about the mechanism behind it and the implication for, for that. Like, why do some groups uh, are uh, observed to be more egalitarian than others? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, I have a question, if I can yeah, jump in. I, I just had a life history question. So I think you said, Lee, that the gestation is eight months and and then they might nurse their offspring for up to a year, the mothers. Does that mean that they have overlapping litters that they're tending to at the same time? No, they're um, they only um, mate once a year. I uh -huh. saw infanticide once, so um, um, opposite to what is known from lions and some um, primates, if there's infanticide, there is no fill up litter, like they don't remate. Um, so they only give, okay. they all synchronize their birth um, in the, and they all give birth in March at the same time. And during that time, we see um, individuals that are one year old still sneaking and trying to nurse, but uh -huh. the mother is trying to shoo them away and don't really let them uh, have access to their nipples. Um, we don't see the mothers being uh, too discriminate. Often we see um, different pups um, nursing from different mothers, but we have we haven't looked specifically on allo nursing to see what how prevalent that is. Great. Um, and Susan Alberts wonders if you know anything about how male social or sexual behavior or vocalizations. Maybe you touched on this a little bit, but if you could say a little bit more about how those change with age. Sure. Um, first of all, we we see that the the singing in self um, gradually change. Um, when, when the males just start um, um, calling out, their songs are very simple. They, they're only composed of males, uh, of whales, and then slowly they add chucks. Uh, and, and then later on, when they're older, they add the snorts. Um, and that slowly evolves. And it seems like we, we often see males um, go away and then come back having a more involved um, vocalization. So it seems to, to mimic what's going on on a physiological and also on a social level. Um, is there another part? I'd like to add uh, one more thing that with respect to the um, uh, mating season, um, I didn't mention that during the animation, but if you play it again, you can see that actually some males seem to use a different tactic. Some males approach groups by themselves. I see them as maybe braver and allowing themselves to, to take the risk and tackle the resident male alone while others aggregate in those loose aggregation of bachelor males. And that may allow some lower ranked, maybe younger males, some kind of small chance of, of copulation uh, uh, by taking advantage of this uh, aggregation. But this remains to be um, explored in details. In detail. All right, thank you. And maybe one last question. Um, Cedria wonders if male hyraxes are like male elephants in terms of growing continuously throughout their lives. And I'd like to add, then does size affect the male rank at all? So no, um, I'll start from the last question. Size does not affect um, male rank. We, we see that they're not related. Social status is not related to size. Um, we've had some really young, aggressive males, uh, not young, small, physically small, aggressive males um, that were dominant. Um, so no, and, and yeah, they do grow. I mean, they do reach a certain asymptote, but there is continuous growth 
So we're only able to really extrapolate for the first few years um, and as to their age. I mean, many of the individuals are known from the minute they're born, from the day they're born, and we know their, age, their exact age, but the bachelors that arrive later on and they're already fully grown males, um, it, it's, it's harder to guess their age and we could um, just guesstimate it in a very rough way. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of our speakers. We're going to stop that it there. And to everyone else, we and everyone, we hope we see you next week, same time, same place for the next installment. Thank you all.